we'll get started in a minute for those who are just joining. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Rick Hassan of UCLA School of Law, and I'd like to welcome you to today's installment of the spring webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project. I want to thank Harley Hamm and Ben Austin DeCampo for their important logistical support today. And before we get started, I want to tell you about some of our other upcoming events. All of our programs are free, but registration is required. On March 2nd at noon Pacific time, I'll be in conversation with Professor Joan Donovan about her book, Meme Wars, the untold story of the online battles upending democracy in America. This will be our first Safeguarding Democracy project that will be live and in person. It will also be uh, broadcast for the live stream. So you can sign up uh, for uh, that event, uh, either in person where I believe lunch will be served uh, or online where you'll be responsible for your own lunch. Uh, on March 17th, SDP will be hosting an all-day conference on the UCLA campus. The conference is entitled, Can American Democracy Survive the 2024 Elections? Details are posted at the Safeguarding Democracy Project webpage. This event too will be both in person and online. We have a tremendous uh, lineup of speakers, so I urge you to go and check that one out. And on April 4th at noon Pacific time. I'll be speaking online with Colorado Elections Director Judd Choate and the Brennan Center's Liz Howard on the topic, confronting the insider threat on election security and protecting election officials, a really urgent topic uh, for today's times, unfortunately, uh, as we'll be discussing. Uh, links for all of these projects, if you're watching live, can be found in the chat. Um, and you can also find them on the Safeguarding Democracy Project website, which is safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome University of Washington political scientist Jacob Grumbach to our series. Jake is an associate professor of political science at the University of Washington. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in the spring of 2018, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University. Thanks so much for having me, Rick. I'm so glad you could join us. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, Jake's uh, new book. His general research focuses on public policy, American federalism, racial and economic inequality, campaign finance, and statistical methods. But his debut book, which has gotten a tremendous amount of attention, you can see how much I like it by all the places I've tabbed, uh, is called Laboratories Against Democracy, based on his award-winning dissertation, it investigates the causes and consequences of nationalization of state politics since the 1970s. Additional recent projects in, uh, of Jake's involve labor unions, election law, and race and gender and campaign finance. He teaches courses in statistics for social science, sciences and in uh, state and local politics. I'm gonna to begin today with some questions, uh, but I uh, invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen if you're watching on Zoom. And I'll try to get to those near uh, the end. Uh, welcome again, Jake. Great to have you with here, us here today. And I thought it would be uh, for a place to start just to kind of talk about what are the traditional arguments about federalism and democratic governance? Federalism is seen as the great genius of the American political system. So could you highlight those arguments and also include a discussion of, of Progressive federalism, which is uh, often associated with my friend and election law scholar and uh, Yale Law School Dean Heather Gerken. What are the supposed benefits of federalism for society and especially today in these very polarized times? 
That's an outstanding opening question. It's really great to be here with you, Rick. Uh, always enjoy our conversations and you're running a, a heck of a series here. Um, honored to be on it. So uh, traditionally, so federalism uh, sold in part uh, as a constitutional design in the Federalist Papers in the 1780s by folks like James Madison. But federalism defined as multi-level governance, where in the U.S., constitutionally, we have uh, separate constitutional authority for the national government as well as state governments. And as the lawyers on know, local governments are incorporated via the constitutional power of state governments. They don't have their separate constitutional authority. But we have two levels of government in the U.S. Constitution. Other federal systems around the world also have this sort of multi-level governance. And the point there is that neither level can fully encroach or abolish the other, again, unlike the state-local relationship uh, that I just mentioned. And, uh, you know, in trying to get the colonies to sign on to the Constitution, uh, some of the, you know, founders really uh, put forward some new and pretty compelling arguments for federalism, for having decentralized institutions and a lot of authority for the state level in American politics. One of which uh, especially from James Madison, is that it would control the influence of factions. No faction would dominate the political system. Uh, the U.S., even at the time, was known as sort of like a large, diverse country, even for only the, you know, property-owning white men, like came from diverse religious sects in the British Isles and so forth, and had different uh, 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 sort of geography that required different governance. So a large, diverse country factions could be contained and wouldn't take over the national government through this decentralization. Another related argument is that it would protect against tyranny and it would be autocrat, could consolidate all of their power in the national government, whereas these bases of state level authority would not go along with essentially ceding all power to this national autocrat. So those are two main optimistic theories of federalism. And later on, Justice Lewis Brandeis uh, uh, put forward the theory of states as laboratories of democracy. When this decentralized institutional system, states can learn from each other as policy laboratories and emulate good policy experiments and reject failed ones. And, you know, wouldn't it be a shame if there was only one national laboratory, uh, the thought went. There's another uh, a bunch of related arguments, but those I would say are three of the main uh, uh, sort of benefits of federalism. Harmony in a large diverse republic, uh, uh, protection against tyranny and laboratories of democracy. But then in addition, in the post-civil rights period, a theory of progressive federalism that you mentioned has become extremely important. And that's mostly in the areas of civil rights for racial minorities and immigrant groups in society, as well as uh, to some extent applied to uh, fighting climate change as well in the US. But both of those cases civil rights and immigrant rights, as well as fighting climate change. In the post-civil rights period, uh, theorists of progressive federalism really highlight the triumphs of state and local organizing on, for example, climate mitigation in coastal states, you know, cap and trade and fuel efficiency standards in California, bubbling and then spreading across states or really, uh, uh, you know, in the case of fuel efficiency standards in California, really uh, providing new incentives for the national car market to improve fuel efficiency. Or on civil and immigrant rights, you have sanctuary cities, extremely powerful forces in protecting the rights of the undocumented in the U.S. And you have descriptive representation of uh, Black and Latino and Asian Americans in ways you would not otherwise have. What I mean by that is that city council members, mayors, state legislatures, uh, and so forth in uh, heavily racially and nationality diverse states can have a diverse tapestry of leaders that wouldn't uh, uh, be in office if we only had national level governance. So that's a theory of progressive federalism. And importantly, I will say, uh, Heather Gerken, among others, makes very clear that the potential benefits of progressive federalism probably wouldn't work without things like the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1965, some baseline national authority. Um, but I'm sure as we'll get into this discussion, I think there are some uh, potential trade-offs uh, to federalism that uh, in the contemporary sort of political moment we're in may reduce some of those benefits of federalism that I mentioned. 
So um, laboratories of democracy, the Brandeisian term is a, is, is a story of race to the top. Uh, your book, I think, if you look at uh, just how the cover is uh, created, um, takes issue with that. So could you tell me, you know, how did you study this? What did you find? And we'll get into issues related to democracy specifically in a minute. But I, I thought, um, you know, for example, uh, when do you see divergence in states? When don't you? I thought what you had to say about criminal justice reform was was particularly interesting. So if you could just talk about the, like the non-democracy findings first before we hone in on you know what this says about American democracy, which is of course the 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 key question in this series. Right. Well, thanks, Rick. I appreciate you reading. And yeah, you're right. I put I took Brandeis's phrase and I put that yellow sticker tape right on myself. Um, so if you buy the book, you'll can peel it off. Thousands Just, of copies here out there in the Princeton warehouse. Uh, yeah, exactly. Ready for, yeah, I was there. I was there taping that on. Um, so I would say uh, uh, there's, I really appreciate you bringing up the argument about uh, sort of policing and decentralized federalism in the U.S. Uh, as opposed to uh, my sort of investigation of electoral democracy in the states, how free and fair and equitable is our voting procedures, um, are is responsiveness to majority opinion in the states is how fair is districting in terms of advantaging one party or another in gerrymandering right so those are two separate things on the former policing and maybe we'll get into this a bit more but this is not something that I have much statistical purchase on because it, you know federalism in the U.S. has not varied a ton right uh, you know, I'm not random, uh, randomly assigning unitary government to the U.S. to see the effect of federalism on policing in societies. But I think I'm trying to introduce a theory uh, that I'm hoping we can get traction on. And that is that American policing is very decentralized. It's constitutionally a state level authority delegated mostly to local governments and state and local governments uh, don't seem to have much ability to control those street level bureaucrats, as they're called, as opposed to the national government with the military and a civilian hierarchy seems to have more control when Joe Biden says, I want the military to invade this country and not this other country. It tends to happen. But when mayors or even governors, the command, the legal commanders in chief of police forces say, you know, I want police to change their behavior around use of force. It doesn't, or I want them to obey a vaccine mandate or something like that, that our local city council has passed. They find that they're not institutionally able to do that. And through the development of policing, that seems to be baked in, which is that uh, police have an extremely high amount of sort of labor cartel power on their own such that local and state governments have a hard time holding them accountable. And contrasting that to, for example, uh, the military and the power of the national government uh, suggests maybe more centralization of policing, as is the case in most other industrialized countries that have less brutal uh, police sort of outcomes, might be a way to get more civilian control over policing, right? Civilian control, you know, democratic inputs can be tough on crime and authority. Voters might want really authoritarian policing or they might not. But one point here is that policing itself has stayed very steady in the face of huge sea changes. Um, one of the biggest social movements of all time and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020 and, and earlier years, then a sort of backlash to it. All these changing political inputs, but you don't see much change to policing. So it seems insulated from democracy and potentially centralizing it may be a way to uh, sort of change the incentives of policing. But that's a whole, like, that's a universal theory of federalism and policing. That's not about distinctions across states. But when it comes to electoral democracy, Again, how costly is it for different groups to vote? Is people in urban areas do have to wait in long lines, but it's easy to vote in rural areas? Are districts uh, drawn in very biased ways to advantage one party over the other in translating votes to legislative seats? Um, is policy in the state responsive to what majority of constituents want? Those sorts of questions of electoral democracy since the early 2000s, I've observed statistically a really clear divergence between uh, red states on the one hand uh, 
especially in the 2010s, passing sort of record setting gerrymandered maps, uh, restricting and making it more costly to vote. I don't measure it, but I'm sure we'll talk about the threat of electoral election subversion that, uh, you know, Rick has written some of the most important work about, but that's something I don't, uh, that my book was coming out right as electoral subversion was hitting the big time. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but those things I'm seeing real divergence, purple and blue states chugging along steady, sometimes expanding access to voting through, for example, automatic or same day voter registration, all male voting, uh, and red states really, uh, drawing, uh, sort of Im unbalanced districts and, uh, making it more costly to vote, especially in the 2010. So that's an area of divergence. I want to talk about some other areas of divergence before we plunge further into voting, because the, the the criminal justice case I couldn't resist um, bringing up because it shows a lack of divergence. Right. Which is, but uh, what if we take labor law, you right. know, wage, oh, gotcha. minimum wage, or um, right to work laws, or environmental laws? Do you see variation, and is, does it follow the same kind of party lines? Absolutely. Yeah. So I have uh, this analysis going back to the 1970s uh, in the book and a related paper where I measure across policy areas. So like Rick said, labor relations in the private or public sector, healthcare policy, uh, gun control and gun rights, um, environmental policy, abortion rights and policy and so forth. Um, what I do observe is that in all of those areas, Essentially, besides criminal justice policy, red and blue states have really polarized in their policy over the past couple of generations. And that's really due to the nationalization and polarization of the Democratic and Republican parties overall in the country, where now what were two highly decentralized regionalistic parties, especially the Democratic Party, became national teams. So now you can tell a lot more about what a state is going to pursue in terms of policy by which party controls its government. And we do see across all of those areas divergence. And that divergence um, is importantly sort of enabled by the federal judiciary, which has become more pro-federalism over the past couple of generations um, through decisions like the NFIB v. Sebelius decision on the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, which said, States can actually decide whether to establish or reject Medicaid expansion, right? That increased even after a national policy like the Affordable Care Act, which should have made states more similar, like many policies did in the mid 20th century from Social Security through the minimum wage, through Medicare, through civil rights and voting rights acts, and so forth. All of those states, all those policies made states more similar. For example, Social Security, prior to that, there were patchwork state programs for old age insurance. In some states, 90% of seniors died in poverty. In some states, not as much. Social Security makes uh, collapses them all. Uh, the Affordable Care Act could have done that uh, with Medicaid expansion, but did not. So instead, you see divergence with major consequences for health outcomes. Health economists suggest that every year, tens of thousands of preventable deaths happen because of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 15 or so states that have rejected Medicaid expansion. So this, again, states are increasingly mattering for people's, not only people's policy regimes they live under, but then uh, as a consequence, their sort of socioeconomic outcomes. And their very lives. Um, exactly. Um, it, it struck me when I was reading that part of the book that there was an echo here. I, I don't think you cite to it, although I confess I didn't read all of your footnotes. Um, to the uh, argument some years ago now by Rick Pildes and Daryl Levinson about how we have our national government as a separation of powers idea. You know, it's Congress against the president, but the reality is that we have separation of parties that, you know, it matters much more if the president and the Congress are from the same party and can get things done, or if they're not, as we have now, and you're more likely to get this kind of um, gridlock. Right. Uh, and uh, similarly too, it's not, you know, New Jersey or Michigan or Texas. It's who controls the government in those states. That's awesome. OK, so in my, you know, meek defense here, like, you know, I'm a quant political scientist and I've been learning a ton. Uh, some of my best friends are lawyers. I'm learning a ton. 
Um, and I, that's something I should absolutely dig into and cite. And I think that's right. That sound that strikes me as uh, generally correct. And I would say this gridlock you just mentioned in the national government, when parties, different parties control one chamber of Commer Congress and the presidency and so forth, um, that generates gridlock. But uh, what Ezra Klein said was a metaphor for gridlock I really like that I'm stealing now is that gridlock doesn't mean like cars just don't go anywhere. They take side streets, right, to get around the gridlock. So it really uh, shifts policymaking energy and investment. And what it did was shift it to the state level. Like I was a college kid or, you know, late high school kid in the George W. Bush administration and then college kid as sort of the Obama presidency is starting. In that time, if you're into like climate change, you said, you know, fail globally, you know, got a Texas oil guy is the president, like it's time to, you got to do environmental stuff at the state level, right? And that was part of this progressive federalism theory, sort of fail globally, act locally. Um, and it's true, it's very tied to the party that controls state governments, provides political opportunity for policy actors that have shifted their sights from this gridlocked national government down to the state level. But even before that, there was really innovative work in that department from the religious right on abortion, for example, innovating new ways to restrict access to abortion that was that fit within constitutional interpretation and legislative interpretation and Roe v. Wade to restrict and make more costly uh, getting an abortion in some states. Uh, so that was sort of a, mo a earlier model um, until the Dobbs decision uh, gave full authority to ban abortion at the state level, suggest, you know, creating increased divergence between states on abortion, even compared to what I was writing about in my book. Okay, so now let's turn to democracy. I've been holding you back. So you <laughs> created something called the State Democracy Index. What are you measuring? What did you find? What does it show? So that's right. Uh, so there I focus on electoral democracy. So democracy is a big old complex concept, and none of us has, you know, I, I wish I had dictatorial con uh, control over the definition of democracy, but that would be <laughs> ironic. Um, we don't. It's a big concept. So uh, I tried to tackle the statistical measurement of one part of that concept, which is electoral democracy. Are elections free and fair? Does everybody have a similarly accessible ability to vote? Are districts drawn fairly? Do votes translate to legislative seats? in similar efficiencies across coalitions, responsiveness to public opinion. And that's sort of a, you know, for a quantitative Americanist political scientist, that's like more mainstream. But I do think there are other conceptions of democracy that are super important uh, in democratic theory and in law. So liberal democracy and deliberative democracy, uh, sort of substantive uh, sort of social democracy conceptualizations in Europe and Latin America about like sort of material equality and things like that. All those really matter, but I'm doing this sort of electoral measure. And I collect in the book 61 uh, indicators. Uh, I then, uh, that also covered some elements of liberal democracy. But as you know, peer review in the American Political Science Review, a uh, poli-sci journal is like, it's very cutthroat, and they wanted me to cut some of those variables that were not as specifically about electoral democracy. I obliged because that I think that was like a good critique. Um, so I'd say my flagship measure, which produces the same answers to any substantive question, but it has 51 indicators of things, quantitative measures of bias in district maps, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, does a state have what's its voter registration policies and, uh, you know, what's the average wait times for voting generated from smartphone data in the era when it was like very scary data access to everybody's geolocation and you could see how long an average person waits to vote. All of these I put into a, another statistical measurement model and that model sort of uh, creates a democracy score for states between 2000 and 2018. With that democracy score, I then am finding that blue, blue and purple states are really uh, being diverged from uh, from red states over this twenty year period, and diverged in, in the sense that uh, Republican led states, um, the democracy index is lower. That longer wait times, 
more restrictions on voting and registration, et cetera. That's so I right. want to I want to kind of talk about the elephant in the room before we go on with the analysis, right. which is there's the point near the end of the book where you say, I've got to call it out and say it. And this is uncomfortable for me because this is not what quantitative political scientists do. That Republicans are doing a worse job on voting than Democrats. Um, why is that tough to say? Yeah. And what does it say about the sensitivity of talking about this when I think we do want to have an atmosphere and certainly it's something that I've pushed where right. it's going to take a coalition of people to keep our democracy together, especially given the risks of election subversion, which, um, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned what came too late uh, for your book. Uh, there was just just an hour ago before I came on this um, uh, webcast, I saw a, a Andrew Hall and a, a co-author posted a paper finding that, you know, election deniers did 2.3 percent worse in voting primarily among Republicans com compared to um, those who were not election deniers running for office in 2022. So it seems to me it's like it's really important to keep a coalition of the center together. And yet, you know, here you are calling out saying Republicans are doing things that are uh, detrimental to democracy. So could you just like talk about that issue before we get more into yes. this? And I can't wait to check out that paper you just mentioned. That sounds interesting. Um, I just uh, linked to it on the election law blog. Awesome. The twentieth anniversary election law blog. As of uh, as of uh, Sunday, it'll be twenty years. You were probably still diapers then, so. Uh. No, I was. Yeah, I was a. I was a cool, cool early high school kid or something. Um, yeah. Uh, the music was so much better. Um, yeah. So uh, that's right. So I would say, uh, in part, there are earlier political scientists and other social scientists that, uh, and often like people who are practitioners in politics from earlier Republican administrations and so forth. So people like Norm Ornstein and, uh, uh, you know, uh, his co-author Tom Mann and things were like, uh, they in the 2010s really uh, put out a number of uh, pieces and a key book, it's even worse than it looks that suggested, you know, the Republican party is uh, becoming extreme with respect to, for example, parliamentary procedure in Congress and scorched earth tactics. And there's been, uh, that was a challenging thing for them to say, you know, I think Norm Ornstein comes out of the Nixon administration too. Like um, for me as a quant as well, there is this idea that, you know, I'm hoping through this quantitative analysis, you set your analyses up to try to be uh, you know, you don't want to set them up to get some sort of answer you're looking for. It's meant to be a uh, social scientific exploration. And what I found is just, you know, I tested a bunch of other theories for why democracy might be contracting in some states, like in the 2010s, uh, we saw contraction of democracy, electoral democracy in states like Wisconsin and North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, to some extent, Ohio and things like that. Um, those states, it could be that local sort of changes are happening within those states. Uh, it could be something like racial threat where uh, influx of uh, immigrants or in migration of Black Americans may uh, produce racial threat that causes voters to take a backlash against democratic institutions. It could be that those places are especially getting especially competitive electorally. Uh, it could be um, uh, you know, something about polarization. It's not about the Republican Party. It's about the distance between the Democratic and Republican parties. So it could be the Democrats going too far left has uh, been part of the problem as well. But what I find really clearly in the statistics is that control by the Republican Party is really the National Republican Party, which at the national level through BRICS and others works we know has been challenging for democracy in recent years. That because it's a nationally oriented party, when that national coalition controls a state, it's and states control democratic institutions like elections, it's gonna weaken democracy in those states. And it really has with major consequences. Uh, and we see that responsiveness to public opinion in a state like Wisconsin is lower. The voice of constituents and constituent majorities on policies like abortion is less heard in Wisconsin because. Uh, districts are uh, drawn in a more imbalanced way because voting is less accessible, especially in urban areas um, and uh, 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 related sort of institutional uh, decisions.
So I want to probe a little bit further into what you're measuring in the democracy index and and just pose a, a little bit of a challenge in asking uh, is it possible that at least some of your measures are not actually measuring the state of democracy but instead measuring posturing by Republican legislators who are trying to please their base hmm. so for example Georgia passes this law after 2020 you know I've yeah, the whole election subversion thing going on in, right. in Georgia where Trump's trying to change the votes. And uh, even though, you know, the leaders, you know, the Secretary of State is saying there's no appreciable fraud. Brian Kemp says, I'm not calling a special session to, to overturn the results of the election. Two Republicans, you know, strong Republicans, you know, that, that, that was, I thought, a great moment when they stood up to Trump there. Right. But, the, but the Republican legislature comes back in session after that. And they've, they've got to do something because their voters have been primed by Trump to believe that the last election was stolen. They tighten up these voter laws. And for the most part, the laws don't seem to have made things worse. Now, there is one provision there that allows for potentially for the takeover by the state right. legislature of counties. And now that we saw that in practice, when there was an investigation, it's a bipartisan group that has to do it. And they said, don't take over Fulton, but you need more funding. Like it was very sensible. And turnout did not go down in 2022, right. although it did seem to go down uh, a little when it comes to uh, on the basis of race, white voters, it didn't go up. So um, uh, I'm just wondering if some of this is posturing in the way, in the same way that, you know, passing a law before Dobbs that says all abortion is illegal. It's like, it's a cheap vote because you know, you get to kind of please your constituents, but you know the courts are going to save you. So what do you think? So that's nice. I think there's two important questions here. One is like, in practice, do these policies that I'm measuring, and sometimes they're non-policy things, they're like actual sort of uh, observed mechanisms of democracy, like the average wait time to vote or responsiveness to public opinion, but many are policies. Um, and it's true, there's a debate specifically about voter suppression. There's been a huge debate and pendulum swing among sort of quants and wonk data journalists and people who are interested in voter suppression and whether it really matters. Um, Gerrymandering is very clearly has mattered. I'd say that's like not controversial at all. But voter suppression, I think we saw this pendulum where I think in 2018, there was this sense among uh, some activists and advocates that like voter suppression is determines everything. You know, it's really the central sort of threat to American democracy and it swings elections in many cases and things. I would say it might have been a bit overstated. And then but then there was a backlash to that theory and the sort of resurgence of a theory of voting policy, election policy around voting doesn't really matter. And it's really just swamped by whether people want to vote or not. That's like really the only thing that matters for turnout. And I think uh, there's uh, a couple of things. One is that electoral institutional policy does affect turnout, especially for subgroups. And it takes... Uh, different methods and things to detect it in different ways, but it is very clear uh, in some of my own research, for example, with Charlotte Hill and others, uh, that uh, uh, voter registration policy is hugely influential for how many people vote and who votes. Um, so states like Washington State, where I am now in Colorado, which you'll be talking about, their expansion of registration through automatic and same day voter registration dramatically increased youth turnout. Like that's actually very, very clear. Uh, similarly, some of these voter suppression policies uh, that are meant to increase the cost of voting, such as removing drop boxes in urban areas and things like that, sometimes are hard to detect on average voter turnout, um, detect effects, but often they do increase the cost of voting, at least for a subgroup in that area. That potential decrease in turnout might be counteracted by voter mobilization groups and just by time marching on and politics getting more intense. Like I would say turnout has generally increased over the past decade in American politics, in part because the stakes feel higher and uh, it's just a really intense time with like very clear distinctions between the parties. So all of that's going on. So I would say 
it is not an argument for those Georgia policies to say, well, turnout did pretty well. Georgia has been in the national like sites and national media and the most expensive Senate elections in history were the Ossoff Warnock uh, elections. This is like a very unique circumstance. And it's clear also that Georgia, for whatever reason, expanded automatic voter registration, not the strongest form you could have, but it does have automatic voter registration, which uh, has increased like the pool of potential voters. Um, so with all that taken to, into account, I would say it's still plausibly the case that the most recent Georgia policy could be considered voter suppression. And uh, I always shout out Emily Zhang's UCLA Law Review piece on how to, uh, she's a law professor at Berkeley now, but how to understand voter suppression when sometimes we have in mind, oh, this is going to reduce the average likelihood of turnout when often voter suppression policies will affect a particular geographic location within a state, will affect a particular subgroup like those who don't have identification or ex-felons or something like that. All of these things do matter at the margin. Um, but then again, we should not be, we should really not think any institutional reform. There was a time when I was coming up in college, campaign finance reform was like the reform to, like that was supposed to usher in like incredible democracy. And now we statistically can observe the destructive nature of Citizens United on democracy, for example. But it's, again, not, uh, this isn't like the thing that's going to like swing the pivot autocracy democracy. All right. I um, do want to get to your questions. Remind you, you can put them in the chat. Uh, I'm sorry. No, you can put them in the Q&A. Got to get my Zoom, Zoom terminology right here. We're only a few years in. Uh, but uh, uh, well, you know, uh, I, I'm surprised I haven't started speaking while muted yet, uh, sure. which is my usual uh, way of dealing with Zoom. Um, a few more questions before I turn to the the audience questions. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about race and, and your last answer and talking about specific groups that subgroups that might be affected. Um, you, you you kind of alluded to race, but let's talk more about your findings in terms of whether higher concentration of minority voters leads to um, you know, states passing laws that are um, more uh, democracy restrictive. What did you find there? And what's the explanation for what you found? Yeah, so I went into it thinking, you know, so my political behavior and political psychology and pollster friends really detect that the strongest determination of vote choice you know, what makes somebody a Democrat or Republican in the mass public right now is attitudes around race and immigration and culture. It's not economic policy. You can learn a ton more about somebody's partisanship from what they think about Colin Kaepernick than what they think about the minimum wage or health insurance. That's not a great place for a democracy to be in because Colin Kaepernick doesn't really have a policy design attached to it, right? It's harder to bargain and negotiate over views of Colin Kaepernick. Um, you, can, you can kneel halfway. Yeah, exactly. It's it's really different. There's the compromise. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and I find that like, uh, you know, it changes to demographics, for example, an influx of uh, immigration to, for example, now there's a lot more Latino immigration in the U.S. South. Maybe that's driving some of this backlash and, you know, causing the Republican base, like you're, you mentioned, to demand uh, restrictions on democracy, but I did not find that. And I interpret it that as not that race doesn't matter in democracy right now. Like it's the fundamental cleavage around the parties. And it's clearly like a mobilizing force of uh, pressure against democratic institutions, like the theory of that you talk about and uh, your recent books of like mass voter fraud by often undocumented immigrants and so forth. That is a theory that's related to like race and immigration um, and is centrally about sort of the main conspiracy against democracy right now. So it's not that race isn't doesn't matter. It's that politics is highly nationalized now, whereas in the Jim Crow period, racial conflict in politics was about is, are institutions here going to be segregated in this town, in this state. Now it's about a national tug of war with entrepreneurial politicians at the state level across the country, whether it's DeSantis or Newsom or anybody, uh, engaged in a national tug of war where race and culture and immigration are the central sort of battle 
terrain. Um, so when Trump was elected, you saw Jerry Brown of California, we're going to protect our immigrants. And now with Biden, you have DeSantis, like, I'm going to do the opposite of, I'm going to like send immigrants up to Martha's, you know, this type of battle, right? Um, so I think it's that politics is around race is nationalized is a uh, sort of answer to this. So it's less important that say a state like, um, you know, North Carolina has a certain percentage of African-American and Latino and Native American voters compared to just the overall closeness of the Democratic Republican split in the state. That appears to be the case. For, for and being the driver. And I think it does integrate like race is central, but overall you see the national polarization at the mass level involves a lot. It's urban rural overlaid with race in many cases. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, overlaid with uh, religious identification and uh, sort of traditional values and things like that. All of that goes into a mix of sort of, I guess, what, for lack of a better term, we call the culture war. And I, I, maybe this is unfair because it's after your book is out and you stop thinking once you publish the book. Um, but how does the, the, you know, the fight over election subversion post book, um, post book drafting, because I know it takes a year from the time you finish that last word till you're actually that book if you're lucky, hits the shelves. Um, but, you know, what do you think the fight over election subversion shows in the states? You know, uh, one of the, and I want to focus this, you know, on the federalism point, one of the big pushes that um, Trump was trying to do was to get state legislatures to come in and declare alternative slates of electors under what I would call a mangled reading of a federal law called the Electoral Count Act that says that state legislature can step in when there's the, a failed election. Uh, and none of them did it. Um, it's not like you can say, well, you know, the Republican states were more likely to have uh, um, subverted the election results. I mean, they, they all stood their ground, although it was a lot closer, I think, some people think. Um, what are your observations about election subversion and federalism? Yeah, no, it's not it's not easy to be asked by, you know, probably the nation's, nation's foremost expert in this. Um, but I would say uh, it's clear. So there was reform of the Electoral Count Act that, you know, when I said, like, how should I think about this omnibus bill that has some reform of the Electoral Count Act last year with the Democratic Congress? Um, I went to election law blog to figure it out. But uh, uh, there I would say the overall question here is, remember, back to the beginning of our discussion, Madison and others in the Federalist Papers says decentralized institutions are going to be less likely to be captured by a would-be autocrat. And I think when you have a would-be autocrat in the White House, that's absolutely the case. That's narrowly true. But what I'm arguing is there's this trade-off, other side of the coin, over long stretches of time, decentralized democratic institutions can erode, can be uh, more easily captured. And because states control democratic institutions, elections for local dog catcher and the U.S. presidency, right? That really matters. Capturing one single node, whether it's a state or even a county, as an anti-democracy coalition is extremely dangerous. You've called it sort of the weakest link in uh, theory of democracy. Um, I think that really needs to be uh, thought about. And again, uh, there's trade-offs. I'm not saying like decentralized electoral certification institutions are always uh, less safe, but I think uh, I'm really noticing that um, uh, long-term capture, as well as all these other problems of decentralized governance with national parties. This is the other thing, is that now that the parties are national teams of politicians for a national tug of war of uh, goals, it's much more likely that you have an incentive as a state or local politician to corrupt the system for national ambitions and to raise your ranks in the party. So it's extremely lucky that this didn't happen uh, in 2020. And 2024 remains to be seen. Um, there are some benefits of the Electoral Count Act reform around raising thresholds for challenging uh, electoral college certification. But I would say, like having independent and at, you know, at least at the state level, not county by county, but I would hope a national agency that's beyond the Department of Justice that uh, uh, sort of sets baseline standards for uh, voter registration, districting, and electoral certification would be a lot safer 
And that gets me to the last question I want to ask you before I turn to the audience questions, which is solutions, where you go near the end of your book. I know when I was writing my most recent book, Cheap Speech, it's like, what am I going to say now? <laughs> like, you know, there are not easy solutions. Uh, so you suggest nationalization of election administration, which is something that um, I've long supported, um, but have essentially given up on for my lifetime. Uh, it seems further and further from a realistic option. I mean, I'm a, I'm a theorist, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you're trying to live in the real world, which is not what I appreciate and why I have you on. If you're a pure theorist, probably <laughs> we would, we would uh, you know, not be talking to the Safeguarding Democracy Project. Uh, so, you know, Heather Gherkin, to take another one of the strands of her literature, not the federalism literature, when, you, when she writes about election reform, she's famous for talking about the here to there problem. It's like, yeah, you can come up with, you know, Here's the ideal form, you know, and the, the body will be you know, elected in this way and they'll do all these things. But how do you get there? Given that our federalism is here to stay and given right. the kind of parochialism where state and local election administrators fight every inch against federal encroachment and what they see as their prerogative set the rules for elections. And given the anti-democratic tendencies within some states, uh, how do you think all of this could be countered short of nationalization? Uh, right. What could be done state by state to assure free and fair elections and fair election rules. That's great. So I would say, you know, it's clear and like you, Rick, have outlined a number of ways of, you know, statizing elections ahead of nationalizing elections as one uh, potential middle ground. But this is in terms of like, I trust, you know, legal and policy scholars around design of these policies in general. But I would say the here to there problem is really crucial. How to how do we build a coalition that's interested in democratic institutions? One thing we didn't get to in, when you were talking about maybe the Republican base is really demanding threats to democracy, right? What makes individuals in a pluralistic society supportive of democratic institutions? There's a big debate about this. But one, I think, out of another line of research with Paul Freimer is, I think we as American political economists and comparative political economists really underemphasize the role of organized labor in keeping uh, sort of mass politics in a sort of negotiation bargaining model rather than a scorched earth like uh, war um, where uh I, I and Paul Farmer find statistically that uh, labor union membership reduces uh, sort of racial resentment and increases support for uh, sort of multiracial democracy in general. And, uh, you know, labor unions were very central to the uh, uh, push for the Civil Rights Act and the Civil Rights Movement. And so I think that's one power building mechanism for uh, democratic interest. Labor traditionally in Europe was part of the push for democratization because workers themselves saw democratic institutions like the mass franchise as being advantageous for their substantive goals. But the sad fact is we ordinary people, including myself, we don't have strong preferences over institutions, right? Except us who like, well, this is our job to care about this. But for most part, we care about outcomes like wages, health insurance, immigration, police, whatever, policy. Um, and there it's, uh, uh, it's really, really important to organize politics around uh, democratic institutions and pursuing those policy goals through democratic institutions. And the mass public, it takes a lot of elite leadership from, for example, media, uh, civil society, large corporations, religious organizations, and so forth that have been part, occasionally, not all that much, in the push to protect democracy, for example, by refusing to contribute money to election deniers, that was temporary, so forth. But all of that mobilizing civil society and reinvigorating the labor movement, I think, is the key to establishing support for institutional reform that would, uh, uh, again, like keep democratic institutions strong or even expand them. The free and fair elections being elevated as a substantive issue, along with climate or wait I've, I've tried that man like i you know there i would say actually is a little it's true in 20 the 2018 midterms and beyond it's true that democratic institutions have are now i think since the civil rights movement are now as in focus for ordinary voters and media coverage as they've ever been so that is one silver lining of the wild times we're living in and that brings me to the first question that one of our uh, 
uh, Zoom watchers ask, which is, did the 2022 elections show a pushback against anti-democratic movements? Is, is this a blip or a trend? I know we've got one data point, so that's hard for a quant, but uh, what do you think? Yeah, with big confidence intervals around my answer, I would say 2022 was a very decent year for democracy. Uh, election deniers uh, lost. We saw this sort of qualitative pattern. I would say it's, it's you know, dangerous that a major party nominated a number of election deniers, and that suggests problems with primary voting and so much more, and the interest group networks and media around this. Like, But I would say losing general elections is a big deal. Um, now there's a paper showing that average. Um, there was this Electoral Count Act reform. But I think it's true that democracy as an issue kind of has mattered in increasing amounts. I don't think that's going to be long term if like the irony here is that threats to democracy have brought attention to it. So I actually hope it's not central on everybody's mind going forward. And there's an assumption that democratic institutions will be stable. But I will say another thing that was good for democracy in 2022 is that mass fear-based appeals around uh, mass voter fraud, around, around mail ballots being like, you know, fraudulent around uh, uh, sort of other conspiracies, the big like sort of crime panic that there was a moderate national increase in crime. That's like a very important policy issue, but it was mobilized in an anti-democracy sort of fear-based collapse like terror mindset, uh, which was could be destabilizing for mass democracy and increases polarization we're talking about. Those things sort of fell flat, like to some extent. That's, I think, a very hopeful story and goes against sort of, you know, the idea that it, it was the Democratic Party, while having this diverse coalition, like did not fall prey to a lot of those uh, sort of appeals that may be destabilizing for democratic attitudes. I thought there were two really interesting developments, I think, yesterday or the day before in the presidential race on the Republican primary side. One, Nikki Haley, she refuses to condemn Trump for being anti-democratic, but she kind of calls him a loser. Like, we need to change horses because, you know, we need someone who's going to ride us in. And, and that can work the same purpose. Um, the other thing that happened was that, uh, and there was, this story was in the Wall Street Journal, uh, it should still be linked on the front page of the election law blog, Trump has realized that uh, he's shooting himself in the foot when he goes after mail-in ballots because right. the Republican Party right. in states like Arizona and Florida have perfected over many years. This is their right. get out the vote strategy. So I see these as both kind of helpful signs that, uh, you know, election denial branding is uh, that along with the paper I just mentioned, um, showing a, a, a decrease in running on that issue. I love the, yeah, the fundraising. Yeah, the fundraising mail ballots point was so outstanding. Like it was the same all caps Trump fundraising email, but like it was, you know, we're going to like really vote by mail and win with this system. So it's that's like an outstanding development of like incentives. <laughs> and then uh, similar, I think another th interesting thing, ambition counteracting ambition, but there's debates about where Ron DeSantis will stand on democratic institutions going forward. But like now he and Donald Trump are in a very like funny competition. And I love the return of Trump. Like this is one thing everybody has to accept. Trump is a little bit funny and his new nickname for Ron DeSantis. He's back. In, he tried Ron DeSant DeSanctimonious. And I was like, that's, that's a little it's too big a word. Yeah. But now he's calling him meatball Ron because he looks like a meatball. I was like, this is incredible it's well, just so anyways right, that that's that sort of emerging. to uh, go after his italian american heritage that that's supposed to remind oh is, yeah okay i don't know all right we've got to have a little hint <laughs> but that competition i do actually think this is one within the same part if they were championing the same party coalition if trump was not so into not just the republican party but himself then i actually think that's could be a good thing for democracy Okay, we've got time for one last question. I think this is a great question, something I ha hadn't thought about uh, in relation to your work. There's a high stakes state Supreme Court election coming up in Wisconsin. Uh, the gridlock metaphor also applies to the Supreme Court's uh, redirecting energy around redistricting to the side streets of state courts. National organizations like Emily's List and Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life have made endorsements in a nominally not nonpartisan judicial race. How do state courts fit into your narrative about federalism and, and, and all of this? Nice, Michael. That's a great question. So 
uh, the state courts are very fascinating here. So uh, one, you know, in places with judicial elections. So, oh, it's so central to the story and I don't do it justice in the book, but one is Wisconsin judicial elections were outstandingly important to democratic institutions in the 2012s and also were a citizen, the first Citizens United uh, election where uh, that really it showed the power of an organized push uh, for a state judiciary around democratic institutions and using those institutions then to empower your coalition. So that was really important. The North Carolina Supreme Court election this past cycle uh, has a sort of new supermajority that I may, may be a bit threatening to democratic institutions and willing to uh, 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 okay some very gerrymandered district maps. And then um, uh, in general, then Ohio is such a fascinating case where Ohio in its constitution has uh, bans on partisan gerrymandering. Most of the country has to deal with Voting Rights Act Section 2 issues of racial dilution of uh, around race and gerrymandering. And then the federal judiciary sometimes is like partisan gerrymandering is OK if it's not like explicitly smoking gun racism. Uh, even though race and party overlap a lot. But in Ohio, they had this partisan gerrymandering bank. So in their recent decisions, like they actually used evidence from poli sci from some great scholars, like people who work on state politics, like Chris Warshaw, who's like a uh, quant sort of hero of mine, like a you know, few years above me in research, but like showing things that gerrymandered partisan bias in districting made policy on in Ohio less responsive to what Ohioans wanted, right? That actually became a part of the evidence, which I haven't seen much in other cases that are mo about racial gerrymandering. So, uh, but then the Ohio Re Republican legislature said, we don't really care what the court's gonna do. We're kind of gonna go with this unconstitutional map anyways. So, you know, does what, you know, you guys who study constitutional law can talk about, I guess judges don't have enforcement powers is the cliche there. Um, yeah, I mean, that was pretty amazing. You had the Republican chief judge um, uh, end up siding with the Democrats and finding a gerrymander, and then they ran out the clock. She was uh, leaving office, and now she's running an anti-gerrymandering organization in Ohio. Yeah. But, but there's no way that the state Supreme Court's going to you know, go that route in the but, same way that the North Carolina Supreme Court changes its, its um, partisan valence and it's going to go the other way. It's so fascinating to look from the outside on law where it's like, sometimes I'm like, it's politics and power all the way down. Like legal rationales don't really matter. And then other times you think, no, like a quality legal argument with evidence, like at the margin really does matter like that, where to some extent across parties, there's some adherence to these norms still and leveraging that, whether it's on, you know, Georgia election administrators who are nominally are affiliated with the Republican party, but don't buckle to pressure or judges, you know, that's where, like, hopefully there's some norms that are holding this democracy coalition together. Well, that's, uh, I'm going to stop there because that's an optimistic note. So like that. Uh, let me uh, thank Jake for taking the time. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And let me remind you, our next event is on March 7th with Joan Donovan, followed by our all-day conference on March 17th, Can American Democracy Survive the 2024 Elections? And uh, in April, we'll be speaking to Judge Choate and Liz Howard about the insider threat to elections from election administrators and how to keep election officials safe. Thank you all. We'll see you again soon. Thank you again, Jake. Take Thanks care. Thanks for coming.